Hi everyone, welcome back to A-Level Biology Help. So today I'm just going to take you through all of the math skills that are required for you to know for HUA A-Level Biology. Now this is just an overview of everything, I'm not going to go into loads of detail, but there are plenty other resources out there if you want to look through worked examples of each of these skills. Please note that I'm not going to go through specific things such as mitotic index and estimated population size. The explanation of those particular math skills are in their relevant videos. So this video might be quite long as there is quite a lot to get through, but as always there will be timestamps in the comments so you can skip to the different sections if you want to do that. Right, so let's get straight into it. So the first skill that they want you to be able to do is to recognise and make use of appropriate units in calculations. This is especially important in the methods of studying cells section in calculating the length or the size of a microscopic image. So what they like you to be able to do is to convert between millimetres, micrometres and nanometres. I already went over this in my methods of studying cells section. So if you haven't watched that video already, you can click the link in the corner, but I'm just going to give an overview now. So to get from millimetres to micrometres, you times by a thousand micrometers to nanometers, you times by a thousand again. And then the opposite occurs in the other direction. So from nanometers to micrometers, you divide by a thousand. And from micrometers to millimeters, you divide by a thousand again. So the trick is if the unit is getting larger, so nanometers to micrometers, micrometers to millimetres for example, the, um, the value gets smaller. Something else that they like you to do is convert between millimetres cubed and centimetres cubed. This is useful in things such as um, volume in gas exchange systems. So to convert from millimetres to millimetres cubed to centimetres cubed, applying the same principle as this, you um, divide by a thousand and then from centimetre cubed to millimetres cubed, you divide by a thousand. Right, okay. So the next skill is to work out the unit for a rate, for example, a breathing rate. Or it could be an enzyme rate of reaction, for example, but the same principle applies. So I'm just going to use this example from this particular exam question. So for this question, they wanted to ask you, um, what is the rate of reaction and what are the appropriate units? So it's important to note that the rate is a change in concentration over time. So this suggests that to calculate rate, you divide the change in concentration over time. This means that we um, divide the units together. So what we do is we write units as grams per decimeter cubed, so the units of the concentration, per second. And for, we write per as a power of minus one. If a calculation wanted you to do the time divided by the change in concentration, it would be seconds per grams per decimeter cubed, but that's not the case here. So the next skill is to recognise and use expressions in decimal and standard form. So you need to be able to use the appropriate number of decimal places. Now, the general rule of thumb is to use three decimal places. However, if it's 
not stated the um, the amount of decimal places that they want you to use. Um, it's good to use the amount of decimal places for the values that they have stated in the question. So if one of the values in the question was, I don't know, 4.35, that's two decimal places. So your answer should be in two decimal places too. You also need to understand and use standard form in calculations. Now, you should um, be familiar with standard form in calculations. Um, so you need to carry out calculations using standard form. That's a good skill to use. So if you were, um, say, multiplying this value by this value, you would need to put these in brackets so that your answer is as accurate as possible because doing it without brackets can lead to errors in your calculations. You also need to convert between ordinary form and standard form. Ordinary form is just a regular number like this one here and then standard form is like um, any number between 1 and 10 times 10 to the power of how many and um, how large the number is basically. So I'm going to use the example of 0 0.0050 and I'm going to convert that into standard form just as an example. So the first um, value in standard form is a number between 1 and 10. So in this case it's going to be 5. So it's going to be 5 times 10 to the power of something. Now to work out what power we have we need to figure out how many times the number between 1 and 10, so 5 in our example, has moved to the right or the left. If it has moved to the right, so it's become smaller, we use a minus negative power. So we need to figure out how many times to the right it's moved back from its um, value. So it's moved back once, twice, three times. So we have to do five times 10 to the minus three because it's moved three times. Now, What's important here is that the significant figures need retaining. As you can see here, there are um, there is a zero after the five, and this is a significant figure because it comes after a value that's more than zero. So this zero needs retaining. So we our answer is five point zero times ten to the minus three. So the next key skill is. You need to be able to use ratios, fractions and percentages with confidence. So the first thing that they want you to know is percentage yield, which would come up in questions about crop growth, for example. So the percentage yield is your actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times by 100. So, for example, if you had um, 2.5 um, grams of something, but the theoretical use, so the expected yield was 5 grams, we need to do 2.5 divided by 5, put this in brackets, times by 100, which would be a percentage yield of 50%. This is a really important skill, percentage change. It often comes up in the practical style questions. So in the osmosis practical that you might have done already. So for percentage change, you need to, need to take the value that you originally had and subtract the um, new value, so the change value, divide it by the original value times by 100. So I'm going to go through a quick example. We have a value of 150 um, grams, let's say, and it has changed to 200 grams. 
So to figure out the percentage change, we do 150 because that's our original value minus 200 divided by 150 because that's our, that that is our original value times by 100. So I will just type that in in my calculator now. So 150 minus 200 divided by 150 times 100. Now, our value comes out in our calculator as minus 33.3. However, we can see that the um, mass has clearly gone up, so we ignore this negative sign. So our percentage change is plus 33.3% approximately. Right, um, you also need to be able to represent phenotypic ratios. This is especially important in the inheritance chapter. So if you're not familiar with the inheritance topic, you can watch my video in the corner. So see if we have a really simple cross based on to heterozygous parents and draw out the expected genotypes and say this is a recessive allele for a disease only this genotype will have the disease because in recessive alleles both alleles need to be um, in the genotype for the phenotype to be expressed so what is the ratio then? There are three um, genotypes which have the phenotype of the normal and then one which has the disease phenotype. So we have here a three to one ratio. So this is pretty easy. It's a basic monohybrid cross. So here is a slightly more complicated cross, which you will come across in A2 in the inheritance chapter, like I said earlier. So this is something I just stole from the internet and conveniently the different colours mean a different phenotype. So we can count them. So for this green phenotype, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine for green, three for pink, three for blue and three, not three, sorry, one for yellow. Now, this is a pretty standard um, ratio for dihybrid crosses, but as you can see, this can't be cancelled down any further. So our ratio is nine to three to three to one. The next skill is that you need to be able to use scales for measuring this again comes up often in the methods of studying cells section. Right so this is an example from a past paper. I think I actually used this in my methods of studying cells video but we're just going to go through how to use a scale bar again. So the first thing that you need to do is to measure how long the scale bar is. So on my screen it was 1.9 centimetres but it will be probably probably be different for you but it doesn't matter because the values will come out the same anyway. Now I measured the next thing that you need to do is to measure with a ruler the longest point of the um, organelle that you want to measure so this point to about this point because that's how long the longest point is and I measured that to be eight centimetres. So the next thing that you need to do is to figure out how many times the scale bar fits into the um, length of the image. So to do this, we divide 8 by 1.9. Oops, sorry. I'll just type that in on my calculator quickly. 8 by 1.9. It's about 4.21. Let 
Now the next thing that we need to do is to calculate the actual length and this is pretty convenient because the actual length of the scale bar, not the um, length that we measured with our ruler, but the actual length is um, one micrometer. So this is pretty easy, we just multiply our um, 4.21 by 1, which obviously is 4.21, and our units are micrometers. So our actual length for our chloroplast here is 4.21 micrometers. If the scale bar was measured to be 2 micrometers, you would do 4.21 times 2 and that would be your actual length. Right. So the next skill that is um, quite specific is to estimate the number of bacteria grown over a certain length of time. So let's go through this particular example. So the mean division time for bacteria for, for a bacterial population, sorry, is 20 minutes. How many bacteria are there after five hours? So. The first step is that you need to calculate how many times the bacteria divide in five hours. So there are 60 minutes in an hour and the, the mean division time for one, um, I'm sorry, the mean division time for the bacterial population is 20 minutes. So this means that we do 60 divided by 20 to see how many times they divide in one hour. And obviously we need to calculate how many times they divide in five hours. So we do three times five, which is 15 times. The next step is that we need to figure out um, how many bacteria there are after 15 divisions. And to do, to do this, we need to do this calculation. The bacteria at the beginning of the experiment, so bacteria at beginning times 2 to the power of the number of divisions. We times by 2 because the amount of bacteria doubles for each division. The number of bacteria at the beginning are 1, obviously, because you start off with 1. So you need to do 1 times 2 to the power of 15. And I will just figure that out now on my calculator. 1 times 2 to the power of 15, which is a value of 3, 2, 7, 6, 8. So 32,768 bacteria are present after 5 hours. So I've just written that, just ignore that. So if you're drawing um, a graph representing representing, sorry, how the bacteria grow over time, you need to plot the logarithm. This is because bacteria divide in such large amounts that it's difficult to use that data in a graphical sense. So you need to do the log of this value, so log So you just click the log button button on your calculator, 32,768, which leads you to a value of 4.52. The next um, skill that you need to know is to use an appropriate number of signif significant figures. So you should have covered this in GCSE maths, but we are just going to go through a, um, another example. So say if you have this number, 0 0.3800000. So that is quite a lot of decimal places, which can, well, it takes up a lot of space and it's quite messy, really. So what we want to do is to... Um, round this up to three significant figures because that's the general rule of thumb 
for calculations. So we need to count the number of significant, significant figures in this value already. So only the numbers after the decimal point count here because um, it's less than one. So zeros before the decimal point don't count as a, as a significant figure. So we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, because the zeros after the whole numbers after the decimal point do count. So we've got seven significant figures and we want to convert to three. This is quite an easy example. So our answer would be 0 0.380. Um, another example, if we had 0.35833, if we wanted to round that to three significant figures, would be 0 0.358. Um, if we wanted to use a slightly bigger number, so 158,000, and we wanted to just do two significant figures, we would omit this 8, and we would do 16, not 16, 160,000, because these zeros do not count as a significant figure as they are before a decimal point. The next skill is to construct and interpret frequency tables and diagrams, bar charts and histograms. So I'm not going to go through this in this video because I explained it in my how to interpret graphs and tables video. So if you haven't watched that already, you can go and check that out in the corner as well. You need to also understand simple probability, so likelihood. You also need to understand the difference between chance and probability and use them appropriately. So chance is the occurrence of events in absence of any obvious intention or cause, and probabil probability is the extent to which an event is likely to occur. So events in a probability situation are events which will probably occur, but chance is something that is just something pretty random though hasn't got an obvious cause or intention. So we need, you need to link this um, probability term to genetics. So we're just going to explain the likelihood of two heterozygous parents with cystic fibrosis to have a child with cystic fibrosis. So if the genotypes are C, big C, little c and big C, little c, for example, we need to do a Punnett square. And Punnett squares are useful to figure out likelihood. So this one is big C, big C, big C, little c, big C, little c, and little c, little c. Now, you should probably know that cystic fibrosis is a recessive condition. So that means the um, the small letter has to be expressed twice for it to, present twice, sorry, for it to be expressed. So only this genotype will have cystic fibrosis. These two will be carriers and this one will not be. Now we can see that there is a one in four chance of um, two heterozygous parents producing a child with cystic fibrosis. So this is a 25% probability that the child will have cystic fibrosis. You also need to understand the principles of sampling as applied to scientific data. You need to analyse data through appropriate means, for example, Simpson's Index of Diversity to measure biodiversity, which I mentioned in my biodiversity in a community video, I think need to calculate or compare the mean, median and mode of a set of data. So remembering that the mean is the sum of the values that you have divided by the number of values that you have. So if you had a data set of one, two, three, four, five, you would add all these up. Let me just do that quickly. Plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five. So that is 15. And we have five values here. 
So divide 15 by 5 and you'll get a mean value of 3. Remember the median is the central value in a set of values placed in ascending order, so from smallest to largest. And the mode is the value that occurs the most within a set of values because that, because that is the most likely value that you'll get. You also need to use a scatter diagram to identify a correlation between two values, not variables, variables, sorry. So here we have a scatter diagram that I just saw from the internet. So this investigates the relationship between internet usage in hours per week and age. So as you can see, the um, as internet usage increases, age decreases. So this means that we have a negative correlation. If, for example, the um, pattern of data points is going in this direction, sorry, that isn't a very straight line, but it should be, that would be a positive um, correlation because both values are increasing with each other. You need to be able to use and manipulate the magnification formula, which again is in methods of studying cells. So there's quite a lot of maths in that. So the magnification um, formula is the size of the Im image divided by the size of the object. So by manipulate, we mean changing the subject. So how would you calculate the size of the image or the size of the object? So size of image would be magnification times the size of the object. And the size of the object would be the size of the image divided by magnification. So how do you figure this out? So something that I've used for a very long time are formula triangles. There are mixed opinions on formula triangles, but I like to use them. So we need to put a magnification M, I for image and O for object. And this line here, the line going across means divide and this line here means multiply. So if we want to calculate magnification, we can cover up the M and you will be left with I divided by O because the horizontal line is present. And then if you want to calculate the image, you would be left with M and O and the vertical line. So that is a multiplication. And then if you wanted to figure out object size, you'll be left with I and M oh. and the um, horizontal line. So you would do image size divided by magnification. So now on to statistics. So an important skill is to select and use a statistical test. So in a situation, they might say, oh, which statistical test will you use? And you may be asked to calculate it. So there are three main ones that um, AQA want you to know about. So chi-square, which tests the significance of the difference between observed and expected results. So that is often used in um, inheritance. And I'm not going to take you through how to calculate chi-square because I mentioned that in my inheritance video. You need to be able to be able to select and use something called student t-test. Student was the surname of the person that discovered it. It's a pretty weird surname, but that's what it's called. And this t-test compares the mean of two groups. So it tests whether the data is as, as expected. And then correlation coefficient is something which measures, measures the strength of a relationship between two variables. That is spelt wrong. There should be a W there. But yeah, it measures the strength of a correlation. So let's just go through the student t-test. So we need to state a null hypothesis. If you're not familiar with null hypotheses, please check out my inheritance video, which is already linked in the corner. So for this particular example that I'm going to take you through, um, our null hypothesis is that there is no significant difference between the number of people who own cats or dogs. 
and here is the formula for the student t-test. Um, it looks pretty complicated. However, these are the means of each data set. So we'll have a mean for cats and then dogs. Um, S means standard deviation of your first data set, so cats. And then this means standard deviation of the second data set, so dogs. And N1 means the number of values and N2 means the number of values for your other value. It looks pretty complicated, but I hope it's going to make sense once I go through an example. So here is just a um, table that I made in Excel. I've already calculated the means and the standard deviations. I'm going to teach you how to do standard deviation later in the video. So here is our formula again. Um, so it's pretty easy that I've done all the means and the standard deviations because we can just plug these into our formula. So our t value will be 7.14 minus 7 divided by square root of 3.98 squared divided by 7 because we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 values plus 3.02 squared divided by 7 again. And our value will be 0 0.0741. So that, that is our final value for t. The next thing that you need to do is to test how significant your results are. And the first thing that you need to do is as in the chi-squared test, is to find the degrees of freedom. Now this is slightly different for the t-test. Um, so for the chi-squared you just do the number of categories minus one. But for um, a t-test you need to do the total sample size minus two. And our sample size, if we go back, is 14 because we have seven year groups and two data sets, so cats and dogs. So our total sample size is 14 and 14 minus 2 is 12. So our degrees of freedom is 12. Now what we do here is look at the row which has 12 degrees of freedom. And we need to look at what our critical value is, which is the value at a 5% significance level. So our critical value here is 2.179. And our value of, if we go back, sorry, is 0 0.0741, which is a lot less than our critical value. So if um, your t-test value is a lot less than the critical value, you need to accept the null hypothesis. So we can conclude that there is no significant difference between year groups. So there is a high probability that there is no significant difference between year groups. If your t-test value was more than the critical value, then you would have to reject the null hypothesis. So there would be a lower chance of that there is no significant difference. The next um, statistical test, well the final one, is the correlation coefficient, which is arguably the, arguably, sorry, the trickiest one. So here I have um, some data, which I just made up, um, investigating the relationship between hours of sleep and test score. So test score out of 100. And I've just calculated the means here. So the mean hours of sleep was 7.5 hours and the mean test score was 77. Now, this is quite complicated, but this is the formula for the correlation coefficient. So the sum of xi, which is just um, the um, values for hours of sleep, minus the mean, so minus 
times yi, which is the values for um, test score in our example, minus the mean, and divide by the square root of the sum of um, this value in the brackets here squared times the sum of this value here in brackets squared. So it looks really complicated, but I hope this is going to make some kind of sense to you all. Right, so um, the easiest way to do correlation coefficients is to set up a table. So we're just going to fill out all these columns in order. So we need to do x minus the mean for each value. So x in our um, situation is hours of sleep. So let's do this value here for 7. So 7 minus our mean of 7.5 is minus 0.5. 8 minus 7.5 is 0.5. 6 minus 7.5 is minus 1.5. And um, 7 minus 7.5 minus 0.5. 9 minus 7.5 is 1.5. And then it's 0.5. Next, we need to do y. And y in our case is the test score. And our mean is 77. So 69 minus 77 is minus 8, 8 minus 19, minus 1, 16, and 4. Now we need to do multiply each of these values together. So not minus 0 0.5 minus, 0, minus 8 sorry, is 4. Remembering that when we multiply two negatives together, we get a positive. We have 4. And we have 28.5, and we have 0 0.5, 24, and 2. Next thing that we need to do is we need to square each of these values. So minus 0 0.5 squared is 0 0.25, remembering that when we multiply two negatives we get a positive. 0 0.25, it would be 2.25. Be 0 0.25 as well, 2.25 and 0.25. We need to do the same for y minus the mean, so this will be 64, 64, 361, 1, 256, and 16. Now, as our formula and mentions the sum of, we need to calculate the totals of these three columns. So if we add all of these values together, we get 63. If we add all of these values together, we get 5.25. And if we add these values together, we get 762. My pen is working. And to make things slightly easier for ourselves, um, because the bottom half of the equation multiplies the sum of the, um, these two columns, we're just going to multiply these before we plug it into the formula. So 762 times 5.25 is 4,000.5. So if we plug these into our formula, so R, which is the letter that we use to represent correlation coefficient, is 63 divided by the square root of 4,000.5. And this would give us a value for a correlation coefficient of 0 0.996, which is very close to 1. So to check if your calculation is correct, your value for correlation coefficient must be between minus 1 and 1. If your value is negative, so between 0 and minus 1, then your um, data is negatively correlated. And if you have a positive value, so between 0 and 1, you have a positive correlation. So our value is 0 0.996, so we have a positive correlation. And this is a very, very strong positive correlation because we are very, very close to one. 
a correlation coefficient of 1 will mean a perfectly linear um, correlation. Right, so I said I was going to take you through how to calculate standard deviation, so I'm going to do that now. So this is our value for standard deviation. So we do the square root of the sum of um, each value minus the mean squared divided by the number of values minus one. A good thing to note that is is that this is the standard deviation for a sample. So this is just a sample that we have um, taken from a particular area, for example. But if you were calculating the standard deviation for a whole population, so for example, if you had data from an entire classroom, you would just divide by n. So I've already calculated our mean to be 18.125. It is important here to keep all of the decimal places um, so our results are accurate as possible. So I'm sorry if you wanted to calculate this already, but um, we have already calculated each value minus the mean. So 15 minus 18.125 is minus 3.125. And I've just done this for every value, so 17, 23, 13, 15, 18, 16 and 28. And then I have squared each of these values. And I have calculated the sum of all these values, which is 172.875. So the next step then is to just plug these into our formula. So our standard deviation is the square root of... 172.875 divided by our number of values minus 1. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 values. 8 minus 1 is 7, so we divide by 7. And this gives us a value of 4.97. Remembering that the higher the value of your standard deviation, the more um, deviated the results are from expected. You also need to um, be able to calculate the percentage uncertainty or error, which is something that students often lose out on a lot of marks in, but it is really simple. So the percentage uncertainty, or it's sometimes described as the percentage error, is your actual value observed divided by the expected value multiplied by 100. The next skill is that you need to understand and use the symbols that are listed here. So this is pretty easy. So equals means equals. This value means smaller than. This means a lot smaller than. This means a, a lot larger than, because it is facing the opposite way. This just means larger than or greater than, it doesn't really matter. And this symbol here means proportional. And this means approximately. So it's just an, you use this when you are estimating something. Right. So proportional means, for example, something um, increases and some, the other um, value increases, for example. You also need to be able to calculate the circumference and area of a circle, which is something that you would have learned quite further down in your school life. So the circumference of a circle is pi r squared. Remembering that r is the radius which is half the diameter. And circumference is pi rd. 
So R is your radius and diameter is the whole length across the circle. You also need to calculate the surface area and volume of rectangular prisms, of cylindrical prisms, so cylinders, and of spheres. So the volume of a rectangular prism will be half times the width times the length times the height. So here we have a terribly drawn rectangular prism here. Our width is 4, which is like the length going across. Our length is 8, which is often the longest side, and our height, which is 5. So by our calculations, we need to do half times 5 times 4 times 8. I'll just type that into my calculator right now. So our value for our prism volume is 80 and our units will be centimetres cubed because we are calculating a volume. The surface area for our rectangular prism would be 2 multiply the width times the length plus the height times the length plus the height times the width. So in our case it would be 2 times um, 4 times 8 plus 5 times 8 plus 5 times um, 4 and this will come out to 124 and then our um, units will be centimetres squared because we're doing surface area. Right so um, the next thing is to figure out the surface area and volume of a cylinder or a cylindrical prism. So the surface area of a cylinder is um, 2 times pi r squared plus 2 pi r times the height and our volume would be pi r squared times the height. Pretty simple. And finally our sphere and the surface area would be 4 pi r squared. And our volume, I forgot to type this, but our volume would be 4 thirds pi r cubed. So this is slightly different here. So one last thing that you need to learn is to how to calculate surface area to volume ratio, or as it's sometimes written, SA to V. So if we go back to our rectangular prism slide, So it's pretty easy to calculate in surface area to volume ratio. We just um, put these in a ratio basically. So, um, so here we just need to divide the surface area by the volume. So in our case here, it would be 124 divided by 80. So I'll just do that quickly on my calculator now. That would come out as a value of 1.55. So if your surface area to volume ratio is large, that means the surface area is large compared to the volume. So that would be advantageous, for example, in gas exchange or um, heat management. You just need to apply your knowledge of um, surface area in different conditions to these kinds of questions. Right, so that is all I want to say for this video. I hope you found this useful. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.